Well, it's good to see you all. Happy Sunday. We're uh, thrilled. I'm thrilled that you are here. Uh, this morning, uh, before we kind of jump into our um, next section, uh, we'll be uh, back in the book of Hebrews and the Gospel of John briefly this morning. But before we do that, I wanted to pause and uh, just recap briefly a bit of where we've been so far over the last uh, eight weeks or so as a church. We would have done this last week would have been a good time, but uh, we had even more exciting news to share about Tyler's transition to staff, and so I'm glad we spent the time doing that. But sort of where we are, if you've been out, perhaps traveling for fall break, and sort of where we are in this vision series, we've really divided it into sections or chapters in a way. So we began with uh, three or four weeks focusing exclusively on our sense of mission and vision. What are we called to do and why are we called to do it? We believe as a church, not the one and only church, but as a church, we specifically are called to embrace brokenness and champion wholeness in and through Jesus Christ. That's what it means for us as a church to be faithful to who God has made us and called us to be. Well, why would we do that? Why would that matter in any sort of way? Well, it's because we believe the why, right? We believe that whole people can change the whole world. And we'll talk a little bit about that again this morning. And from there, we moved on uh, to a next section where we began to ask questions of how. How are we going to go about doing this work? Not what exactly are we going to do, but what or how are we going to approach the work of embracing brokenness and championing wholeness? And we said we really believe that for us, to be true to ourselves, to be true to how we understand God's work in the world, that we believe transformation happens through relationship. You may remember we talked about C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves. He talks about different types of love we as humans experience, but he has a great quote there where he talks about that friendship. We began using that language. Friendship is the common connection over a shared passion. But that in friendship and through friendship, we open ourselves up to transformation. He would say it this way, that eros the kind of passionate love, sexual love, where we get the word erotic. Eros creates naked bodies. Friendship creates naked personalities. Eros creates naked bodies, but friendship creates naked personalities. Going all the way back to Genesis, right? We were made for nakedness. We were made for intimacy, for connection, not only with one another, but also with God. And so we believe that it's that kind of vulnerability, that kind of honesty, to do so within boundaries, to do so with wisdom, and we'll continue to talk uh, more about that, right? But how we go and move towards intimate friendship will be important. But that's a foundation to how we see our future together going about this transformative work in the world. <coughs> And so we begin to talk about, you may recall, sort of three orders of priorities, and we'll get into this later. But uh, that we said we really believe that much of this transformation, much of this work of embracing our brokenness and moving towards our wholeness so that we can embrace the brokenness of others, move towards the wholeness of others, that's going to happen through transformative relationships, through small group ministry, all these sorts of things. And then we're going to move into broad, sort of church-wide outreach initiatives, one, two, maybe no more than three key ministry initiatives that are going to allow us in a broad way to intersect with the deep need of our community, our region, our world. And then we'll move to a broad base, this kind of entrepreneurial culture, which we'll talk about this morning, allows us to then launch these new, quick, um, agile uh, micro-ministry initiatives. That's a little bit of the framework of how we're going to do it. And then beginning last week, we turned to the last chapter in this 12-week series on uh, core values. There are for us five core values that this vision process identified with. Core values being the things that we structure our life around, that we structure our time, our energy, our money. A church is just like a family, just like an individual. Um, passion, purpose, value dictates how we spend our life. 
That's true for us as a church. And so uh, what you'll find over these last few weeks of our vision series, it'll take us through the month of November up until Advent, is that we'll lay out uh, five of these core values. Two of them uh, will be for us as a church, I think, familiar. It'll be a return to values that perhaps existed from the very beginning of the church, a recommitment, a renewal of some values, perhaps even a recovery of these values. And three of the five will be, uh, in a large way for us, new. And so there's both the familiar, a return to the old, and a commitment to the new. And uh, well, let me, let me finish that thought and then say one more thing before we move into our second core value for this morning. Last week, we um, focused on our first core value, which is a recommitment to the next generation. If you were to go back and ask folks around the city, maybe you may even remember that um, our uh, culture, our legacy as a church, in many ways is tied to our impact among teenagers. Um, some of you may have been first introduced to this church uh, as a teenager, um, and we believe that our calling, our purpose, the way God has made us, and even who God continues to bring to us requires us, again, in order to be faithful to who God has made us to be as a church, that we structure our values and our vision around connecting with the next generation. We also believe it's incredibly wise and strategic to do that, because what better way to promote wholeness than to begin speaking it into the lives of children, perhaps before they encounter much of life's brokenness, or at least that they may be prepared for it, equipped for it, when brokenness, hurt, disappointment, pain comes. And so we began that conversation last week. Today we'll move on to our second core value. But let me tell you just briefly about what's ahead, what's beyond. Advent's coming, it'll start here really in just a few weeks, if you can believe it or not. Christmas is coming, winter is coming, right? But for us, after Advent, it'll be 2020. And this is what I can encourage you with and let you know that in 2020, change will come. How we do church will change. How we live into this sense of vision, it will require change. It will require work. It will require creation, development, reorientation of values, reorientation of physical space, reorientation of our resources. So change is coming. But part of the reason early on we made the decision to go through 12 weeks of exploration and explanation was really for this reason, so that when change comes, you know why. So that when we face a difficult decision, you'll be prepared. Now, I don't say this to frighten you. I don't say this to startle you or to make you anxious. I think it's exciting. I think you're ready for it, mostly because you keep telling me you're ready for it. But Ron Heifetz, who teaches out at uh, Harvard University in the Kennedy School, has a great line where he says, people don't fear change, they fear loss. People don't fear change, they fear loss. And so inevitably there will come for us in the coming year a change. And change in and of itself isn't scary, but there's a part of us that says, I'm afraid of what this change may mean. I'm afraid that uh, we'll leave behind something that I don't want to leave behind. I'm afraid that there'll be loss, and that may be true. But the hope is, as we take this journey together and begin this conversation, we see not only is it a conversation grounded in Scripture, not only is it a conversation grounded in God's calling for us as a church, but it is a conversation grounded in the promise of the way maker that God has gone before us. God is preparing a place for us, that whatever is to come, it'll be worth it. So you may be sitting there, and I know none of you would say this, because this has been the best eight, nine weeks of your life, right, since we've been in this vision series, but some of you may be saying, all right, well, let's get on with it. Let's do this. 
Let's flip this thing over. Let's change this from top to bottom. And the change will come. The work will come. And I'll begin to share more with you about it, about what that looks like over next year. Next year is going to be exciting. It's really for us an opportunity to begin developing the systems, the processes, the pathways of preparing ourselves, of developing leaders, launching new small groups, preparing new ministry initiatives, really preparing ourselves to do this work. It's going to be great. It's going to be exciting. But inevitably, it will require us to make hard decisions, to take big risks, to step out in faith. I had a, um, one of my mentors in ministry was a music minister I worked with in Knoxville. He was an interim music minister for two and a half, three years. It's a pretty long interim. But he was a retired music minister, um, he, I'm going to say nice things about him so I can tell you his name, but his name was uh, Wendell Bourget, retired music minister, and he was this lovely, wonderful, charismatic uh, Danish man. Had the greatest hair and mustache I've ever seen in real life. It was unreal. He was this wonderfully vibrant, wise pastor, came after retirement, helped us out in Knoxville at our church. But I'll never forget one of the many things he taught me. He said, uh, our job as leaders, whether we're leading a country or we're leading a team of volunteers, he says, our job as leaders is not to create questions, but to answer them. He says, our job as leaders is not to create questions, but to answer them. And so part of the hope is that over these 12 weeks, we are proactively, wisely answering your questions. Maybe questions I don't know that you have or you don't know that you have, but the hope is that through this process we lay a foundation of commitment, of belief, of structure that says this is why we're going to do the hard things. This is why we're going to take the risk. This is why it's going to pay off in the end. Because Jesus has gone before us, making a way and calling us to adventure. We'll have more to share with you about this, give you some tools and some resources to kind of wrap your hands around the fullness of this vision experience. We'll get you some nice uh, kind of manageable uh, uh, single sh uh, sheet, uh, one page uh, kind of resources to give you some tools to help talking about this, learning it, embodying it going forward. But I wanted to pause and just kind of, again, give you an insight into why we're doing what we're doing and where it's going to take us in the year ahead. Um, there's already a pretty a vibrant roadmap of uh, objectives and things we want to do, and we'll get to that towards the end of our series. Um, this morning, I'm pretty excited. We're going to be back in the book of uh, Hebrews and the Gospel of John. So if you want to start flipping there, we'll head in that direction, and we'll even spend a little bit of time talking about Kanye West along the way. So it's going to be a good morning. <laughs> So uh, if you've got a copy of Scripture, let's go ahead and turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And as you're doing that, let me uh, just give us a little bit of background and context. So this morning for us, our second core value, our first, is a, a recommitment, a re-engagement to the next generation that we believe we are uniquely called and equipped uh, to make big sacrifices, to dream great dreams, to do big things, working with and sharing the gospel with the next generation. The second core value uh, that we have this morning comes largely from Hebrews, but also from the gospel of John, and it's a core value. It is a core commitment to a pioneering spirit, or what I would maybe call a pioneering power, the power of the way maker, the one who makes a way where there wasn't one before. I'm going to read for us uh, a section of Hebrews chapter 10. We actually touched on this for a different reason uh, a few weeks ago at the start of October um, when we talked about the importance of connection, of friendship, of transformative relationship. Um, but before I do that, let me, let me go ahead and, and just give you a little bit of preface on the book of Hebrews. 
um, just a little bit of context because we'll be drawing this core value, this core commitment out of here. Hebrews is a really interesting book. Um, it's a challenging book in a lot of ways, and here's just a few things that we need to know about it. The first is that the book of Hebrews doesn't really tell us much. It's not very helpful. It doesn't tell us who wrote it, and it doesn't really tell us who it was written to. So we're kind of lost in a bit. Um, and so most people, when thinking about, uh, there's some good guesses as to who it could be, but really no persuasive argument, no consensus as to who wrote the book of Hebrews. And so when we talk about the author of Hebrews, we actually refer, most, uh, most scholarship refers to the author of Hebrews as the preacher. The preacher, just a generic title. Because while Hebrews doesn't tell us who wrote it or to whom it was written, it also doesn't really follow a familiar pattern as we see in the rest of the New Testament. It's not full of narrative and story like the Gospels. It doesn't follow the normal conventions of a letter like Paul's epistles. It really, as best we can tell, follows the form of an ancient sermon. So the next time you're sitting there saying, gosh, the service is going a little long. I'm really ready for lunch. That queso is calling, right? That Sunday queso. You could say, well, at least we're not reading through 13 chapters of Hebrews today, right? The preacher, the sermon. Uh, a good uh, preaching professor of mine says that any good sermon has at its core a question. Every good sermon at its core has a question. And so for us, if Hebrews is the sermon by the preacher, we should be able to ask ourselves, what is the question of Hebrews? And I would tell you, because we won't read through all 13 chapters this morning, I'm sorry to disappoint you. That the question at the heart of the book of Hebrews is this. Is Jesus enough? That's it. Is Jesus enough? A great professor, a uh, writer, preacher, um, by the name of Tom Long summed it up this way. Tom Long, if you ever get a chance, um, a lot of his things are, are pretty scholarly, his writing, but if you ever get a chance to listen to his sermons, he's really one of the best. He's recently retired as the bandy chair of preaching at Emory University. He spent his whole career at Emory and Princeton. Um, really one of the best living preachers, thinkers, writers on preaching um, today. He wrote a commentary on... Um, the book of Hebrews, and he sums it up this way. I just want to read this brief description for you. Since we can't read the whole book together, he summarizes it for us. What really are the issues at the heart of the book of Hebrews? And he sums it up this way. He says, The preacher's congregation is exhausted. They are tired. Tired of serving the world. Tired of worship. Tired of Christian education. Tired of being peculiar and whispered about in society. Tired of the spiritual struggle. Tired of trying to keep their prayer life going. Tired even of Jesus. Their hands droop and their knees are weak. Hebrews 12, 12. Attendance is down at church. Hebrews 10, 25. And they are losing confidence. They are tired. Resonate with anybody this morning? They are tired. And so for each of those questions, there is at the heart of it. They're tired of serving the world, tired of worship, tired of education, tired of being different, peculiar, whispered about, tired of the spiritual struggle, tired of having to work at the prayer life, tired even of Jesus. At the heart of it is the question, is this Jesus guy, is this Jesus thing enough? What's fascinating about it is, as you might have guessed, the preacher's response to that question is, yes. But what's fascinating about it and what I think is instructive for us, one of many things that's instructive for us this morning, is how does the preacher respond to these concerns? How does he respond to the exhaustion, 
to the sense of defeat, of pain, of disappointment, of the struggle of the Christian life. He doesn't respond to it with eight simple steps to living your best life now. He doesn't respond to it with a good church management book. He doesn't respond to it by taking leadership advice from the best business owners in the ancient world. How does he respond to this deep need? He responds to it by preaching a sermon and by preaching a sermon about Christ. The book of Hebrews is uh, pretty safe to say one of the most elegant, technical, complex, and rich expositions on the theology of Christ in the entire New Testament. His solution to the exhaustion his solution to the tiredness, his solution to feeling like you're just too tired to keep doing this thing, his solution is to preach and to preach about Christ. He doesn't dumb it down. His solution isn't to lower the bar, but to raise it. So with that in mind with, on the one hand, that tiredness, that exhaustion, that maybe hits a, even a little too close to home for us this morning. And also with the belief and the hope that Jesus really is enough. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. I'll read for us 10, 19 through 25, and then we'll move ever so briefly over to uh, John chapter 14. We'll hear from Jesus himself. Verse 19 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way, a new way, through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good work. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. There's a lot there. Let me draw your attention to the, those first few verses. By his death, Jesus has opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place, right? Back with me to the temple, the Holy of Holies. So holy, in fact, remember in, in the Old Testament, we see that the holiness of God, the power of God, so much, so powerful that to look on it, you would die. Moses has to hide in the cleft of a rock to see, not God face to face, but to see God's back. And even that basically lights him up like a Christmas tree for days upon days. The Holy of Holies, the chosen priest could go in once a year, and even that was such a risky proposition that they'd tie a rope to your foot. And if you didn't come out after a little while, they'd just drag your dead body out. So you better hope that you were ready, right? That God was present in the world, but always at a distance, always having to be mediated through the priesthood and even for the priests. It was at times a risky proposition. And since we now have a great high priest, Christ, who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. All right, keep your finger there. Flip with me real quick to John 14. To Jesus' own conversation about the power of God. I'll read for us just a few verses. Let me start in verse 6 and we'll go through 14. Jesus told him, told Thomas, I am the way. 
There's that way again, that way maker. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had already known me, you would know who my Father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Scandalous. You've seen God. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Sometimes it's easy for us, perhaps for those of us that grew up in, uh, with some exposure to the Christian faith, to have a tenuous, a difficult relationship to the power that's been entrusted to us. Many of us, somewhere along the way, picked up this notion that really uh, our faith sort of renders us largely powerless, but we have access to this really powerful God, this sort of big brother in the sky, right? It says, well, hey God, I could use you to come in and take care of this for me. I could use you to clean this up, to make this easier, to make this better. I can't really do much about it, but I would love for you to take care of it for me. Right? Sound familiar? But what does Jesus say here? He says, not only will you do the same that I have done, but you, even you, will do far greater. Not, you'll get to see me do more of the same. You'll get to see me do greater. Though, we do get to see that along the way, don't we? But that you, you will get to be involved. You will be active. You will be a person of power in the world. And you will do the same powerful, life-changing time-shifting, world-bending kinds of things that I have done, and you'll do even far greater. Even far greater. So often it is easy for us to miss out on the power that has been given to us. But what's important here in Jesus' language and John's sort of part of this broader conversation on his relationship to the Father, it's easy for us to miss it, which is why Hebrews is such a great help here. What's important for us to remember about this relationship we have to the power of God is that it is the power of God given to us. It is not power that is innate to us. It's not power that is solely our possession, but it is the power of God given to the people of God. That it is because of Jesus Christ that in him and through him the temple curtain has been torn, access, full access to God, to seeing the Father, to experiencing the Father, to being entrusted with the power, the transformative act, the redemptive act in the world, that is made possible because of that great high priest. 
And so we have to come to terms with the power of God in two different ways. One, we have to come to terms with the fact that God has given it to you. And God has given it to me. And we also have to come to terms with the fact that it's been given to us. Most of us, myself included, settle for a faith, settle for a Christian journey that is all too content to be powerless. All too content to say, well, gosh, I hope we could do something about this, but either way, I'm just keeping my head down. I sure wish things would get better. I may even pray about it for a little while. And then to roll over, to move on, and to live life just trying to survive. But that's not the way of Christ, is it? That's not the way of the way maker. And so you may be sitting here this morning, perhaps rightfully, or at least justifiably skeptical. I don't know. This New Testament stuff, that seems like New Testament kind of things, right? Miracles, I don't know. I don't know if I really believe that. Demons, I'm not so sure. Just sounds like diseases to me, right? But Scripture says, no, there is power. There is freedom. There is hope. They're at the feet of Jesus. Say, so I don't know if miracles happen today. I don't know if transformation really happens today. I don't really know if I buy into this idea that whole people can change the whole world. And that's fair. But I would say even this week, there's pretty good evidence that the power of God is alive and well. And you don't have to look much further than Kanye's new album. Kanye's new album dropped, as the kids would say these days, right? Dropped on Friday afternoon about noon called Jesus is Lord. No, Jesus is King. king. Sorry, Jesus is King. <laughs> the last song on the album, I think, is Jesus is Lord. Jesus is King. And it follows for him, if you go, you can listen to a two-hour interview that he did with Zane Lowe from Beats One Radio, where he charts for him his journey towards a commitment to Christianity, a journey through addiction that began when he was exposed to pornography at the age of five, that travels through the ups and downs of fame, that ultimately leads him to a life of repentance, of transformation, and dare we might say it, a little bit more wholeness on the other side. A little bit more wholeness on the other side. Now, if you really, as I had a pastor friend of mine, as he was listening to it, he says, you really can't tell me that miracles can't happen. I'm listening to a Kanye West album featuring Fred Hammond and Kenny G. <laughs> Which is true. Fred Hammond, one of the great living uh, gospel artists. Kenny G, of course, is Kenny G, right? But who would have thought, whether you followed Kanye up close or at a distance, who would have thought that Kanye would ever choose to lend his time, his talent, his connection, his platform, his voice to an album about Jesus. The hope of wholeness, the transformation is possible because the power of God rests in the people of God today. The writer of Hebrews has to say it this way. You can flip just a page or two over to Hebrews 12, which gets us to our commitment 
I'll talk about this morning. I'm going to read uh, from, it's actually from the, the, I've been reading as I normally do from the New Living Translation. Let me read uh, these couple of verses to you from the New Revised Standard. I think they render it really well. This is Hebrews 12, 1 through 2. After Hebrews 11, it's probably what most of us are most familiar with in Hebrews, uh, the entire book. Hebrews 11 is the Hall of Fame of Faith, right? Talks about the ever building, ever building legacy and connection between the people of God, bringing about the redemption of God in the world. This is incredibly important because God continues to choose to bring about the redemption and healing of the world largely through who? Through you and me. Through ordinary people of faith. You can read all about them in Hebrews 11. But that hall of fame of faith culminates with who? With Jesus at the beginning of chapter 12. And it says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. An often overlooked dimension of Jesus' identity. And we too, as followers of Jesus, by extension, right? Is that Jesus is what we've sung about this morning. Jesus is the way maker. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm not the one who's simply traveled down the way. I'm not the one who's followed in the footsteps of others down the way. I am the way. I make the way where there is none. I am the way when there is no other way. And at the heart of the preacher's sermon, is Jesus enough? The answer is simply yes. Because Jesus is not bound to your limitations or mine. Jesus is not bound to the constrictions of a disease. Jesus is not bound to the limitation, to the pull, to the grasping of an addiction. Jesus is not bound to your imagination. Jesus is not bound to my problem-solving capacity. Jesus is not bound because he is the pioneer. The one who makes a way when there is no other way. When there is no other way, there is always still one more way. And the power that rests in Jesus, the pioneer of our faith, that power rests in you. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. And I will send you one who will come to be with you. The Holy Spirit. And you will do the things that I have done and you will do far greater things. And so what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us as a church? We believe, we are committed to the fact not only is there something to be said for us, for our culture, for the way, our story, for how we do church, that there is something about this place and us as a people that's attracted to making a way, to doing things that no one else has done before, to creating a path where there isn't to doing church like no one's done before. But it's not newness for the sake of newness. It's not being different for the sake of being different. But rather, it's about making a way for those who have no other way. 
It's about making a way not forward for ourselves, but backward to those who've been left behind. It's about making a path for those who've been stranded by the brokenness of life. It's about making a way between them and Christ. And so we believe, we value, we structure ourselves, we sacrifice for the belief that one of our greatest gifts, one of our greatest responsibilities is to steward the power that has been given to us. It's power that doesn't come just from me being me and you being you, right? But it comes to us through the grace of the great high priest who made a way through the temple, who brought us to the feet of God, who, as Hebrews later says, approach the throne of grace with confidence. Don't go in there expecting to die. Don't go in there with your leg wrapped up, with some buddies ready to pull you out. Go with confidence. Because the love of God, the grace of God, the power of God is waiting for you. And so my encouragement to you, church, it's twofold. One, as we live into our shared future together, may you live into it with us together with the expectation with the expectation that we be people of power, that we be people who believe who believe in our capacity to change the world, not because of who we are, not because of our own strength, our own resources, but because of the power given to us, because of the transformation that God is at work bringing in ourselves, because whole people can change the whole world. But that my hope for you and my challenge to you is not only one that you keep us accountable, that you keep nudging us along the way and saying, you know, I don't think this requires us to step out that much further. I don't think this takes much faith. I don't think this takes much of God's power at all. Because we can do that ourselves. If you feel that, if you see that, challenge us to be more. Challenge us to dream bigger challenge us to risk greater. But that as you go, second, into your life this week, my encouragement to you is that you step into one relationship. Step into one situation. Step into one problem in your life. One challenge, which some people would say is merely just an opportunity, right? Right? But step into one relationship, one problem, one challenge, one arena. And try stepping into it with power. Saying, I believe God does great things and I believe God's empowered me to be a part of great things. Think that relationship with a parent or a child is beyond you? Don't give up so quick. Think that marriage you're a part of can't ever get any better? Don't give up so quick. Think that there's not much purpose, not much left in the tank for you to contribute? Don't give up so fast. Don't lose sight of the fact that power has been given to you. Power that we see from the beginning to the end of Scripture that is not meant to just do fancy looking things, but to change the world, to change people, to change lives, to change history. That power lives in you just so long as you don't lose sight of who gives it to you. Maintaining that relationship, maintaining that connection is essential. 
And so for us going forward as part of our shared future together, we believe that we are called to be pioneers. That we are called to be way makers. Because that is who God has made us to be. As our band uh, comes up this morning, we get ready to close our time. I thought... Um, what better way to uh, transition us than to leave you with just uh, a few of uh, Kanye's lyrics this morning. Really, if you haven't listened to the album, I would encourage you to do it. Um, one, uh, just on a personal note, any album that has a song dedicated to Chick-fil-A, <laughs> On Sunday, you my Chick-fil-A. That's right here. I'm just letting you know. It's good. It was. <laughs> but his album begins with a choir. And the song, Every Hour. Sing every hour, every minute, every second. Sing each and every millisecond. We need you, we need you, we need you. Oh, we need you. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. The high priest has made a way. Not for you to live a life of faith, that's full of fear or resignation or impotence or tiredness, but rather to live a life full of power. Power to renew relationships, power to heal brokenness, power to overcome addiction, power to transform the trajectory of families, communities, cities. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Sing till the power of the Lord comes down. Church, let's stand together and sing. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. A few moments later, Jesus says, You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. As you go this week, church, go in the confidence, go in the hope, go in the belief that attached to the vine, you can bear much fruit. I think one of the great mistakes we make today is cutting ourselves off from the vine. Don't fall into the trap. Don't believe the lies. For God has come in power and love and given it to you and me. Go in peace. Go in hope. Go in power. Amen.